Today's reading is taken from Proverbs 1, starting at verse 1 to 23, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instructions in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let us lie in wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke, then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. This is the word of the Lord. 150 years ago, life was less complicated. (laughs) I mean, I wasn't, yeah, none of us were around to actually experience it, but we know that, don't we? Uh, uh, Men, men would get a job, probably the job that their father did, whether that was down the mines or working in the fields, and there probably wasn't much choice. Women worked at home and tried to get married. Again, there probably wasn't much choice. Not a big pond to fish from. The reason I'm drawing that contrast is because nowadays, every day seems full of choices, doesn't it? Back then, the food on the table was just whatever was available. There were no uh, bananas, no kiwi fruit, certainly not in London, just good old apples, apples and pears. Think about this, cornflakes hadn't been invented. It's a thought, isn't it? I can't be the only person in the room who's ever been to the cereal aisle and had a kind of a moment of kind of like, oh, I don't know. You just sort of seem paralyzed. I I, I get kind of paralyzed by all the choices. There's just so many different options. And nowadays we need to make choices all the time. It can be overwhelming. And it can lead, lead to otherwise rational people doing some quite strange things if they're trying to make big choices, whether they look at horoscopes or Ouija boards or spiritualists or fortune tellers. Or, for those of us in church, an approach to prayer, which is sort of praying desperately to God and then looking out for coincidences, hoping that through those coincidences, God will somehow guide and steer our lives. Like the young man who was convinced he was going to be a missionary. He just didn't know where to. Until one day, he was watching TV, and he saw an advert for Brazil nuts. Well, I guess we can be thankful he didn't see an advert for Mars bars, can't we? 
Where should we look for guidance? That's the question of today. Whether it's big decisions or everyday decisions. And what we, uh, Sandra read to us in Proverbs, that invitation in verse 20, wisdom says, come and listen to me. She raises her voice in the public square and she offers to guide us. She, she promises if we listen, she will help us to make the most of life, to make the kind of decisions that will bring blessings to us and blessing to those around us. Uh, back at the beginning of the chapter, in verse 3, she appeals both to the simple, which are those lacking knowledge, and to the young to learn from her. In verse 5, she appeals to those who are already wise to add to their learning. And in verse 22, at the end there, she reaches out not only to those who are sympathetic to her words, but to those who are mockers and who are fools who reject knowledge. And she calls them to repent, to come back, to turn away from their foolish ways and come back. And if so, she will pour out her thoughts to them. That's what she promises. So today's sermon is, is linking wisdom that we've been reading as we look through Proverbs uh, with this need, this desire we have for guidance in the many decisions, the many choices that we make. Let's, let's start with, uh, with, a, with a diagram. Because when we talk about guidance, I think a lot of us think about something quite individual to ourselves. We're on the lookout for God to guide us specifically in anything we think is a big decision. And the result is we approach decisions and getting God's guidance a little bit like trying to hit the bullseye in a target. So let me explain the diagram. The box around the outside, which on this screen almost reaches the edge, but anyway, there's a box around the outside, and that's God's sovereign will. That's because everything in the whole universe falls within God's sovereign will. It's what it is for God to be God. He is in charge of the stars and the planets and all the animals and the birds and the fish and the invisible beings in the spirit realm and the human beings on planet Earth. Ultimately, God's will will be done on Earth as it is in heaven. Which means God's in charge of the bad stuff too, isn't he? The suffering, the disasters, they're under his control. Even evil and sin are under God's control. They don't originate from God because sin and evil are when human beings or beings in the spirit realm rebel against God. But he even weaves rebellion into his purposes. Extraordinary. And when it comes to human beings, God has told us what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, and that's the circle on the diagram. It's what's taught right through the Bible. It's summarized in places like the Ten Commandments. It's God's moral will, we might call it. And his call to you and me, simply, is to live within that circle, to live within his will, which, of course, is a good life. It's a, it's a life that reflects his character, his good purposes. When we don't do that, when we're disobedient and we step outside of his will, we miss the target, he's still in control. We're still within the overall box of his sovereign will. Somehow he allows it without willing it. And he calls us to repent and come back, to come back again into that good place within the circle. The bullseye view of God, say, wants to be more specific. It, it imagines that right at the center of God's moral will is a personal plan for you and for me and for everyone that we first of all have to discover somehow and then have to follow, particularly when it comes to the biggest decisions of life like who to marry, where to live, what course or what job to do. Two problems with that idea that there's a bullseye we have to hit the first is, it suggests that there's a plan A for your life and mine that we've got to somehow find. Uh, and um, if we don't, or if we find it and then make a different decision, then somehow, well, you know, we've now missed plan A and we're on to plan B or plan C or plan, well, however many letters there are. What happens if seven years into a marriage you get the fabled itch? The seven year itch. What happens then? Does it mean that, you know, well, it doesn't feel the same anymore? 
Does it mean you've married the wrong person because you didn't hit the bullseye and you need to look again? What happens if you don't get your grades and you can't do the course that you were convinced that God wanted you to do and everyone else thinks you can do? What, what, what then? Do you resit? Do you go in a different direction or do you sit in a darkened room watching Netflix because you just can't decide? <laughs> There's a problem with this this sort of trying to hit a sort of, well, it's, it, we believe it's there, but God actually hasn't described God's will for me anywhere in the Bible, has he? And that's the big problem with this view, is I can't find this teaching in the Bible. For, for example, the idea that there is the one, romantically, that we should all be on the lookout for, for you and for me. Now, it, uh, if you're married, then you know who the one is. It's the person you're married to. <laughs> That's God's will for married couples, isn't it? Is to make marriage work and to work and pray and love each other through all the ups and downs of the years. But for those who are still looking, the idea of the one comes more from Hollywood and from Hans Christian Andersen than it does from somewhere in the Bible. Which is why the next diagram is closer and is wonderful actually it's closer to what the bible teaches that actually <laughs> there's a whole load of freedom in god's plan for you and me uh, the box is still there god's sovereign will it's he's he, he's god uh, his moral will it's the same it's it's what's revealed in the bible but within that is not a tiny bullseye but a whole load of freedom freedom always has a boundary God is the one who makes the rules, not you and me. We're not the one who decides what's right and wrong. That's the essence of sin, just like in the Garden of Eden, though. Uh, just like in the Garden, the first human beings, they were given freedom to eat from the trees around them, eat the fruit of any tree you like, said God, apart from one. I'm just going to give you one boundary, one taboo. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Otherwise, go and explore. Go and discover. Don't be the ones, though, to reach out and grasp after deciding what's good and evil, because God has already done that. It's an expression of his character and his goodness. But within that boundary, go and explore this amazing world, these incredible bodies. Go and enjoy the world. That's God's plan for the human race, for you and me. And so it is that we're not supposed to go through life trying to work out some sort of tiny bullseye and we have to persuade God to reveal to us somehow. Instead, we have a freedom within the bounds of God's moral will to discover and express ourselves. Let's, let's look at um, uh, an example. The job you do. We spend a lot of time on thinking about that, many of us. But actually, if we read the Bible, it doesn't matter so much whether you're a dentist, a dermatologist, or you empty dustbins, whether you play the violin, sell vegetables, or work as a vicar. You are free to choose. Yeah? You're free to choose the one that you're best at, that you enjoy the most, or at least the one that they offer you when you go for the interview. What really matters as we read the Bible is not which job you do, but how you do your job. What kind of person are you when you go into work Monday to Friday, or maybe, maybe all, all seven days of the week for some people? H how are you with your colleagues? Do you love your neighbour as yourself? How do you think about your career or your education? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength? Or do you love money or status or reputation? Would anyone you work with know that you follow Jesus by what you say or by what you do? Do you see how it's different? We're not trying to sort of, oh, I've got to work out the 
No, we're trying to say, well, no, God said a whole load of things about how to live well in the world. And we've got freedom of choice on all kinds of areas. But he also said a, a whole load of things that we want to put into practice as we live our lives, whatever we choose to do in terms of a job. What, though, about guidance? After all, God knows me better than I know myself, doesn't he? He knows what's best for me. And the Bible encourages me to pray about everything, doesn't it? So, of course, we'll pray about our big decisions. <laughs> of course, you will. And, of course, we'll look to God to answer those prayers in any way he sees fit. But we won't sort of sit around doing whatever the equivalent for you is of watching Netflix because we can't decide. We'll get on with life because he's already said a whole load to us, load to us in the Bible about his will and purposes for us. We have in Proverbs and right through the, vo- the Bible the voice of wisdom, which does two things. The first thing wisdom does is it guides us and persuades us to get inside that circle of God's moral will. After all, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we read in this little section we heard read. And we've looked pre- previously, um, uh, again, a couple of examples. We looked previously in uh, a sermon uh, about the repeated warnings that wisdom gives in the early chapters of Proverbs against uh, adultery and lust. Wisdom has explained how destructive those things are, like, like heaping burning coals into our laps. She does all that she can to counsel us away from sex outside of marriage and instead to wait for and head towards the freedom of enjoying sex within marriage, within that circle. Someone we're married to, someone we stay with and we enjoy God's gifts with. Uh, Another example is in the section we read today on the reality of peer pressure. Did you spot it in verse 10? It was after that sort of long introduction. uh, Sorry, long heading. Um, A group come along and and they say to us, well, well, come with us, come with us, come with us. Let's lie in wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Do you realize that was in Proverbs? It's an analysis of gang culture and knife crime. Because the origin of that is not modern cities, but the human heart. The temptation, if you look down to verse uh, 12, is to believe we'll get away. We'll, We'll get away with it. The appeal is verse 13. Well, listen, we'll fill our houses with plunder. We'll get rich quick if we sell these drugs, if we intimidate these people, and if necessary, if we stick a knife in. But wisdom counsels, verse 17, that gangs like that won't get away with it. What they're doing is seen, it's obvious, and verse 18, their violence will ultimately come back on themselves. Uh, We would say it, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. That's an example of wisdom doing her best to say, get inside the circle of God's will. Don't rebel and stay outside. Get inside this good place of what God says is good. And then wisdom does a second thing as well. And this is what we've been focusing on in this series on Proverbs. She, she helps us to make the most of our freedom, to live well in the world according to how God has made things and how they should work. Uh, one more example. Uh, we looked a few weeks ago, didn't we, at friendship. Uh, for example, Proverbs 18, verse 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So uh, applying this, this, this sort of thing we've been thinking about, we're inside the circle. We are free to be friends with anyone. And actually, as we look at Jesus' example, he was, wasn't he? He spent time with all sorts of people. That's his example to us. 
But wisdom is speaking to us within that freedom and saying, well, hang on a minute, you're not Jesus. You haven't got quite the same capacity he had to always stay on the, on the straight and narrow. So beware of having unreliable friends, friends who'll take you off track and seek the kind of friend who sticks closer than a brother. Yeah? So that we're free, but wisdom's counseling us. This is what we've been looking at through the summer. And we said back then when we thought about friendship that um, that search for the friend who's closer than the brother actually will ultimately lead us to Jesus, the one who lays down his life for his friends, the one who brings us back to God in friendship forever. And that's an example of the multiple ways, actually, that wisdom will point us beyond wisdom itself to Christ. Because... Uh, what wisdom offers, her principles and her, her, her help for human beings, is actually, it's pointing forward to the one who is wisdom personified, Jesus himself. It, it's fulfilled by Jesus and in Jesus. And another example is her, her invitation uh, here in um, verse, 20, uh, 20, 20, verse 20. Uh, to come to wisdom, to come to her, and to receive life. And in verse 23, to repent of going after our own ideas. And if we flash forward in our minds to Jesus and his teaching, he repeatedly invited, didn't he? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Or the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So this is wisdom. It points us to God's moral will and it takes us into that place of goodness and, and shapes our lives to say, well, let's live life to the full. And for those of us who have found Jesus Christ we have not only the external word of wisdom on the page, we also have the internal witness of the Holy Spirit because as we become God's friends, as we get forgiven, we also have that internal lift and lead from the Spirit towards what is good to make the most of our freedom and to live well in the world. That is the vision of the Christian life. I don't know whether you realize that, that actually God wants us to live out a really full life, a really flourishing life, a life where we do discover what we're good at, but we discover it in the sense of having a go at things, the freedom to explore and discover that way, rather than just sort of sitting and waiting for some sort of TV advert to tell us to go to Brazil or to Mars. Now, of course, when we've got a big decision to make, we will pray. Of course we will. It's part of what it is to know God as Heavenly Father who loves us. We're relating to him. We, we, we lay our burdens before him. We say, God, I need your help. Please give me wisdom. We take it to God. But actually, as we live our lives day by day, all of the time, God is leading us already. He's guiding us already by his word and by his spirit to live right in line with his will, because that's the best way to live, and also to make the most of our freedom, to live a fulfilling life, to become wiser, and to become more like Jesus day by day. A moment to pause. We'll leave that, um, leave that, sorry, <laughs> could we leave that diagram up? Just to pause on the different ideas there, and uh, each of us possibly to respond in prayer. Father, this has been a time to think about ideas and how they fit together. Father, where uh, there have been helpful links made between what's there on the page and between our experience, uh, we pray that you would continue to speak your word into our lives, continue to shape us by your wisdom, to be men and women, to be boys and girls who live according to your word and your will, and who 
make the most of our freedom, make the most of our lives to become people who are Christ-like and who glorify him in all of our ways. And we pray that in his name. Amen.